Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Season 2, Episode 4 of A Studio of One's Own. My name is John, and I am the host of this show. This series of dialogues is proudly presented by DEC and seeks to connect audiences to photographic practices from across the region. Season 2 of A Studio of One's Own spans eight episodes, with new episodes airing live on a fortnightly basis. At the end of today's 45-minute conversation, we'll be keeping 15 minutes for questions and answers from our audiences. So please put in the, any questions that you have for tonight's guests into the Facebook Live chat box. Joining us tonight is Stefan Chow and Lin Huiyi, better known as the art duo Chow and Lin. Chow and Lin's practice lies in their methodology of statistical, mathematical, and computational techniques to address global issues since 2009. Chow and Lin's projects are driven by the discursive backgrounds in economics, public policy, media, and are further augmented by enduring exchanges with specialists from these fields. Their works have been showcased in many places around the world, including the Trenale di Milano, Recontres de la Arles, China Central Academy of Fine Arts Museum, as well as the National University of Singapore Museum. Chao and Lin are based in Beijing, China. Hello, Stephen. Hui. Hello. Thank you Hello. so much for joining us tonight for this conversation. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, John, uh, for having us. And obviously, thank you to DAC uh, for hosting us. So it's a pleasure to have you here joining us today. And so first up, how are both of you doing? I know, Stefan, you just had quite an exciting journey <laughs> to get to where you are. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so for me, I was supposed to get to Shanghai on Saturday. And uh, I think this is something that is not very familiar with Singapore audience, but there was a typhoon that was striking Shanghai. And um, in China itself, there was actually a catastrophe where uh, floods flooded uh, Zhengzhou in Henan province. Mm -hmm. So basically, Shanghai was shut down for an entire 48 hours. Um, no planes, no trains uh, was able to enter and leave. So I was basically stuck outside. Um, uh, I had five cancelled flights, five cancelled trains. Eventually, I got to Shanghai just for one night. And then I'm back in Beijing now, so we only right. go back to Beijing early this morning, like 2 a.m. Well, so, I'm so glad that you made it back in time for our talk tonight. I was, like, I was following developments very, very closely and very, very eager and excited for you. Um, so, you know, as always, I always feel like a wonderful way to begin, you know, such conversations uh, really is just kind of just delve a bit into the history of your art practice and you know, slowly we'll come up to date with some of the projects uh, from the more recent past. And so I've prepared some questions for the two of you tonight. And to start off, I, I thought we'd start with a more fun question. Um, which came first? Was it a dating, married couple, or was it an artist duo that came first for the two of you? Well, um, it, it was dating or it, it was becoming friends and understanding each other and uh, where our interests and passions lay. Uh, and we found also uh, intertwined um, interests and of uh, trying to understand the world around us. Uh, we got to know each other in NUS um, during our freshman years and, and we got together pretty soon. First day of university. <laughs> wow. Yeah, orientation <laughs> camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we, we, we knew each other back then before we, we even knew what we were gonna do. Um so yeah, so 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 becoming artists was kind of an incidental um path for us as we grew um more into our own personal uh journey in in, in you know uh in, in understanding the world uh and and we tried to combine our passion and our combined skill sets uh and outlook. Uh, mm. together into uh, presenting something in a, in the form of art. Uh, right, but right. when we first um, sort of our own personal um, interests and, and um, passions um, in mm. understanding these issues ourselves. Yeah. And, and for me, it's always very, very interesting because I, I know that the two of you actually come from 
quite different academic kind of backgrounds, even though both of you met at orientation camp. <laughs> um, so Hui, you were trained as an economist, while Stefan, your academic background was, I think this was like, well, surprise, surprise from you. And I found out your background is actually in engineering. Yes. Um, so, so from these two disciplines, you know, how did it come, come into art? You know, how did the decision to work together as art duo come about? Um, I think, I think the very fact that we have very different backgrounds um, um, and, and, and where we get our information comes from very different disciplines um, shows that there is a lot of potential for conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and the conflict actually comes from the discussion of topics that we actually have very similar interests in. So I remember while we were still dating, we will mm -hmm. talk about certain topics, um, a lot of current topics, um, geopolitical topics, um, and so on. And we will always have opposing views about it. Uh, right. And this is not just based on our disciplines. I think it's also based on our different upbringings mm -hmm. and our rather different worldviews. And I think we actually took that as um, a very healthy relationship, I think, because we we communicate a lot and we disagree a lot. And I think eventually we also met certain points where we were able to agree on certain things. I and I think when we went into our various professions, so I was um, basically working as a photographer uh, in the early years of my career and um, she was still a civil servant in Singapore. I think that is when we started diving into topics that we felt was really interesting and, and, and it wasn't quite sure of how we wanted to do it, but we felt like we wanted to do something together. Mm -hmm. And this was using our expertise. And I think this is when we really started doing our first body of work. And I think this was really through um, a lot of discussions. And when I say discussions, it, 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 it's actually a, a more positive term because I think during then it was more like arguments. <laughs> arguments on... On, on what we were trying to do that made sense. Um, mm. And I think in the end, um, uh, it worked out really well because I think uh, Oops, very sorry for the technical problem there. Um, but okay, Stefan, Hui, you're back with us. So we've got to get you to kind of like pick up from where you last yes, left off the arguments. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, we, we, we have very different positions. I think from our, I'm not a process person. I, I, I and I, uh, related to political economics, um, I, I also need to understand the full picture and, and kind of before I, I form my own position on it. So, yeah, so yeah. I, I'm of the mind that, you know, like one's academic training, you know, like regardless of the discipline that you come from, right, it always plays a role in shaping that artistic process somehow. So, how do you see? you know, your education backgrounds, right, affecting that, those methodologies when it comes to your art making? Um, I think definitely affected quite a bit um, because yep. I'm actually trained as an engineer. Um, yep. I like to think about systems. I like about things where there is actually something definite uh, in it. Um, you know, like when you tell me a problem, you have to discuss the problem in concrete detail and the solution few that things are very good but I mean, I think that has always been an engineering background in how I do things right. and at the same time besides being an uh, I was a very serious 
so 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 what I find about it is there is a particular in the way I like to look at things. Mm -hmm. She and what about yourself, Hui? Yeah. But it, I mean, yeah. So I. Um, I think the 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 base process for me um, has very much been driven by uh, understanding frameworks, uh, methodology. So I, I think given experience in you know the academic uh, of learning, I understand the gap of of system, the gap uh right or, or and it happens when you do more you have so many different things you a uh, a step back and and you know when you're doing a, a modeling or forecast mm -hmm. so i appreciate those gaps and i also know that it has to be something more than a discipline in trying to solve an easy multi stick uh, collaboration and iteration uh, needs open for, for pollination because there's going to be so many um, issues are not going to be um, solved just by any single discipline. Right. So, <clears throat> so, you know, from what you have said, what, what are those kind of like key thematic concerns that, you know, the two of you have sought to address, you know, over the course of your art practice? Initial projects of poverty, it really spoke about um, poverty in different yeah. countries. And from there, um, dive on situation of poverty, we all have inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not just talking about um, Singapore as one country, and we are certainly not just pointing at uh, the developed, looking at the world whole, oh, and we realize there's Similar issues, we look into that. Realize that um, related to income inequality is um, uh, related to capitalism, mm -hmm. is related to related to and interconnected short memory span. Uh, uh, short memory span. We think about the things that we have during childhood. Stories that always went with children and seems to more than and I think humans tend to have a short memory. Then when you look history, I said that history always repeats itself. Oh, ten um the missed humankind, the past. And so I think we became very interested in global tipping points. Mm -hmm. Basically, this uh, point that, that, that when left, when left it, it points become turning point. So as revolutions happen, uh, civilizations have collapsed. And uh, basically, the world has fallen on uh, uh, simply because resource scarcity, whether it is conflict management, whether it is uh, inequality between the societies and, and the big. Uh, I'm interested to look at history and also look at our current and see things points are. Uh, Right, right. And of course, you know, the poverty line has been the longest ongoing project. It has spanned um, 10 years. You, two of you have traveled 200,000 kilometers, you know, and it, it has, you know, produced case studies spanning 36 countries and territories. It's been the six continents. You know, it's a massive undertaking. And I have so many questions about um, that particular project. But I'm curious as to what sparked it initially. What was that you know, tipping point that you know, made you decide to go in that particular direction?
Many apologies for the intermittent technical problems. Uh, the internet is a bit shaky, I understand, due to the rain that's happening uh, in China right now. Uh, but let's pick up where we had last left off. And so I was um, inquiring about, you know, the poverty line, which is um, the two of you's longest ongoing project. You know, it has spanned um, 10 years, 200,000 kilometers. Um, you have, it, it spanned 36 countries across six continents. And that is by far a very, very, very massive undertaking. And um, I have many questions about it, but I think the first one that um, we should start off with is what sparked that interest um, and what sparked the poverty line? Why the specific focus on the issue? Um, I think this was actually two years before the project actually took place. Mm -hmm. And up to then, we were already communicating a lot uh, in terms of the world that we were seeing. We, we, we both had different world experiences and we were both kind of like reporting back on what we were experiencing and what we were feeling. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was one particular week um, that was actually um, um, very um, special for me because it really felt like an anchor point. Um, I spent the same week in two cities, New York and Kolkata in mm -hmm. India. And when I, was in, in, uh, when I was in New York, everyone told me that when you go there, you have to look up because of the skyscrapers, because of the Wall Street because of everything that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I looked up, but I also looked down. And when I looked down just outside Wall Street, you see people who are homeless, just yeah. begging for money, uh, just outside Wall Street, while people were walking around with $500 AirPods, uh, sorry, with iPods. And yeah. you have these white um, uh, wires just coming out from their black clothes. Yeah. And so it was very distinct. And then when you enter the subways, uh, the homeless people were actually using that as a shelter after hours because that's the only place that they feel safe uh, late at night. Yeah. And within the same week, I found myself in Kolkata. And as the car drove from the Kolkata airport into the city, I noticed that the poor, which were numerous, were actually um, sleeping on the road itself. Mm -hmm. And I asked the driver, why, why is this so? And the driver said that was the only place they could sleep without being chased away because the road is considered public property, whereas um, uh, you can't sleep outside buildings because that's considered private property. So that question that came to mind was, was it better to be poor in Kolkata or New York? And I knew there was no easy answer. And so when we started talking, I think um, that was really that one incident that really struck us. And so we went out to try to explore um, what does poverty really mean um, in this case? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, the project also has been exhibited in many, many countries around the world. You know, uh, it's been exhibited in Greece, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore as well, France, China. Uh, just, just, just a few of them. It's been exhibited in many more. And what also piqued my interest was in each of this presentation, there's always some slight variation to how it is presented. Um, so the question is, how, what do you seek to achieve you know, um, with these different visual effects in each incarnation of its representation? Oh, um, I think we, we try to do something different each time because we always learn um, from audience feedback on, on how they react to our works. And I think over time, uh, at least we try to feel that our presentation has improved. Um, but I think more importantly, we want people to see the works and also see themselves in the process. Because what essentially the poverty line is about, is about food choices. It's about the food choice a poor person would have in a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And this spans across different countries. And what we find is that when we show this in different countries around the world, very often um, the first question that people have is that what are the choices that people in my country who are poor would have in a single day? Mm -hmm. And once they have that, then they start looking at different countries. And usually they look at neighboring countries around them. And then they look at um, countries around the world. So what we find is that 
the poverty line is actually a rather moving experience. For hmm. us, when we first exhibited, I think we just wanted to show the work as how we felt it. Uh, what we didn't expect was the audience uh, reaction. Because uh, I remember when we first had our exhibition uh, in Beijing, this was the first exhibition we had back in 2012. So that's nine years ago. Um, as the show opened, we were just standing back and, and I don't think many people knew we were the artists. And you can really see people uh, looking really hard at the pictures. People were trying to figure out what we were trying to say. And people were reading the artist statements and when they realized what this was, they went back to see the work again. So later on, we approached some of these people and uh, we even got emails from, from, from some of the audience later to say that they were actually quite moved uh, by it because they saw their own uh, point of view on how much they could actually afford and yeah. how much people in the photos depicted uh, could actually have. So I think constantly we are trying to find different ways to, um, to, to represent that in a physical space. And for us, uh, we always felt that the poverty line, in fact, our works are best um, experienced in person. Right, uh, right. You can see that online, you can see that in a desktop on our website. Um, that's, uh, we, we think that that's a great introduction to our work. But I think the most powerful presentation is always in person. Of course, you know, to, to see that sheer immensity of like the wall of photos um, representing, you know, the, the, the options that, you know, these people with very, very limited resources have. Definitely, I think, a very, very moving um, experience. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, I think earlier this year, uh, sorry, the poverty line, you know, the, the book uh, was launched earlier this year. And back in 2019, it was also awarded the Luma Ren Contras Dummy Book Award. Was it always part of the plan for the poverty line to become a book or was it more of a natural evolution in that sense? Um, yeah, we, we did not have that big a plan for, for the work in itself, but we it, it, things kind of evolved. And for us, as we uh, also amassed uh, more and more um, data, in a way data points, but in, in the way of visuals uh, in, in our in, in our collection, then we wanted really also a way to present it that allow people to go in depth into understanding the issues as much as we also digested a lot of research along the way uh, and, mm -hmm. and on the ground as well. So the book kind of became a natural evolution of what we felt would be able to give people more in-depth understanding of the topic. Uh, and, and that's why the book format really tries to not only provide the visuals, but also include uh, a lot of the background research, also um, contributions from essays from um, people involved in policy and, and, and academic and research uh, areas. Uh, so that it really, um, for, for readers and, and audiences who are interested, there's really so much more uh, into it that we can go into. Hmm. And, and, you know, I was, when I was preparing these questions and uh, I saw online that, you know, poverty line, you know, uh, 2010 to twenty. 20 and I was like oh the project is complete and then when we had our earlier conversation our pre-conversation you said oh no 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 it's still ongoing it's still ongoing and I was like oh, okay okay yeah wow so there's there's, there's a, maybe another 200,000 kilometers for you to travel so right now what do you foresee being the next step of development for this project? I think for us what is really interesting about the poverty line is an ongoing situation yeah so um, uh, poverty has always existed when there are societies. Mm -hmm. um, the moment money was created, um, either in the form of a coin or, a, or an animal bone or the currency that we have today, um, there has been a separation within the society between the have and the have-nots. Yeah. So poverty itself has always existed as a situation uh, a lot of it is dependent on the, the intensity uh, or the ratio of what poverty is. So I think for us, doing 10 years of poverty line is merely scraping the surface of things. And uh, obviously, we also have a limited lifespan uh, for what we are doing. Yeah. But obviously, for us, I think to do this over uh, a longer period would be interesting because I think 
um, we always see uh, world development, human development as a linear curve. Somehow things can only start to improve on and on and on. I think little do we know that things like the pandemic can actually shake things around. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, again, time in history, uh, we are reminded that um, human development is never a linear curve. It's, uh, at best, it's a seesaw. At worst, it could well be a squiggly line that yeah. goes back and forth. So, so I think even with the pandemic right now, um, the most vulnerable in the society are basically even more uh, at a disadvantageous uh, state right now. Uh, whether it is the accessibility of vaccines or whether it's the accessibility of aid, um, we basically see the poverty line to be discussed again simply because uh, it has become a really real struggling issue for people right at the bottom of the pyramid. Right. And you yourself had mentioned, you know, um, I, in our earlier conversation prior to this interview that, you know, the poverty line itself has become a somewhat central node from which other projects have branched out from. And to me, I see scarcity and perhaps more accurately, actually, an unequitable allocation of resources. You know, it's one of the strongest undercurrents running through several of your projects. And with the equivalent series of works, I, I think that particular series really draws attention to the distinction between um, the idea of price and value, um, especially to different demographics around the world as well. Uh, could you share a little bit more about the Equivalence series? Uh, sure. So the Equivalence series uh, really talks about um, the meaning of value and, and where does value and function um, you know, how do they weave into our lives and how are our perceptions were written, colored or mirrored um, by the, the equation of money. Uh, so in, 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 these, uh, in this series, um, equivalents, we're looking at daily items that you know, are really very common, um, but um, there is a certain sense of, so there is a sense of, um, you know, where, what, what, what is the price uh, and, and value of items um, in, in our daily lives and, and how do we actually uh, go about in our choices uh, and usage of these uh, and how are they appreciated? I think um, values uh, for, for us has been, I think, uh, because maybe of, of my economics and background as well, has been fascinating uh, in trying to understand how a lot of our, our current systems are organized around this whole notion of valuing something or not being valued. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, you know, in, within these uh, collages, um, do you intend for those items at the center of them, you know, to be representative of any specific uh, demographic? And in addition, how do you decide to correlate certain of these like uh, baseline, uh, you know, everyday, everyday goods, right? to the premium ones in the center. What was behind the decision process? I think what is really interesting is that um, the word premium is yeah. very subjective. Yeah. Um, because uh, for some of the um, juxtaposition, we were basically juxtapos uh, juxtaposing um, a smartphone cable, specifically an iPhone cable, together with a hundred uh, ramen. And this was actually taken in Tokyo itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the whole idea of a smartphone wire to be um, premium, um, a lot of smartphone users would disagree with that uh, simply because uh, smartphone penetration has already hit sky high uh, in many, many countries, not just the developed ones, but also the developing ones. For example, in India, uh, smartphone penetration rate is higher than accessibility to clean toilets. Um, yeah. in so, so, so to actually say a smartphone wire is unimportant is not necessarily true. But what we are also showing is that there is a disparity in terms of value when you look at things that is measured by money. And yeah. when you look at 100 items compared to one, um, there is a sort of absurdity because a lot of the 100 items that surrounds that one seemingly premium item are essentials. Mm -hmm. They are food items. They could even be labeled as junk food. But yeah. junk food, again, is subjective because under very comfortable situations, under very comfortable conditions, junk food 
is merely food that has a lot of calories. Right. But hey. junk food, uh, sorry, but junk food um, in extreme conditions such as war, conflict, or even in mountaineering is actually very healthy food because it's the food that packs the most calories within that um, mass. So, so I think the whole idea of equivalence challenges our notion of what is value and what is not. And in the end, and, and, you know, that particular work that you mentioned with the mantles and um, the iPhone cable, um, that work's titled Decentralized Value Systems. And it's part, one of the works within that series. And with that particular piece, um, the two of you drew attention to the rise of like, cryptocurrency and decentralized financial systems. So the first question is actually, I'm curious as to why, why the choice of mantles for that juxtaposition in this particular instance. Um, it's actually quite coincidental because we started um, using mantles as one of our poverty line items back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And we remember specifically that it was 50 cents renminbi mm. per mantle uh, in China back in 2010. And yeah. over the years, as we photographed the poverty line in China, we realized the price have gone up steadily in a linear fashion. Yeah. And so last year, back in 2020, the mantos value reached a very convenient mark of one renminbi. And incidentally, we also looked around and we realized that China no longer used cash as a form of medium. Uh, when you go out, whether you are going to purchase a newspaper that costs very little to paying for a very expensive meal, you no, no longer take out cash, which we used to do when we first arrived in China. But yep. today, everything is done through e-payments, through mm -hmm. um, uh, WeChat Pay and through QR codes. So you can see that even the value of money has started changing to the point that a mantle could represent value of something even more than the currency, the, the physical currency itself. So I think what we were exploring um, in this is this whole idea that um, as one solution comes up to replace a seemingly problem, yeah. the problems it create be, um, outstage the existing problems in the first place. So I think when we look at um, this, this, this project, um, uh, I think it's, partly coincidental that we use mantles as a form of value, but a mantle also has um, significance in, in China history. It was supposedly invented by Zhuge Liang, depending yeah. on the process that you, 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 you look at. And the reason why it's mantles is because it is shaped like a toe, it's shaped like a human head as yeah. an offering to, uh, to the enemy, uh, to distract the enemy then. So the, the, the whole notion of the bun um, has historical significance and also present significance because it is still seen as a staple uh, across Chinese societies. So I think when we created this work, I think it's, it's partly to address the rise of disruptive technologies. Mm -hmm. And disruptive technologies are often used um, as, a, as, a way, um, as, a, as a way to rise to, to solve certain problems. But I think as artists, we are also worried that the problems they are trying to solve creates even bigger problems, especially people um, who are not part of the system. And what does that happen? We only see a wider divide within the society uh, when this happens. Right. And, and actually, we know when we come to talk about these decentralized financial systems, you know, um, Bitcoin, you know, China has been increasing its crackdown on Bitcoin farmers uh, in mm -hmm. recent time. It's uh, creating an even more volatile, I would say, uh, Bitcoin market than it has been uh, in the past, in the prior to this new crackdown. So given the, the timing, you know, was this work in some ways intended as a response to this particular scenario? Not exactly. I think, I think basically it's not just China that is, um, that is edgy about the system. I think a lot of countries... Mm -hmm. uh, are treating this with a 10-foot pole because um, I think they all see cryptocurrency as a disruptor in financial systems. So, so I think for us, when we look at 
when we look at um, our body of work, I think we are not necessarily just looking at cryptocurrency. We are also looking at the, electron of, uh, it, the electronic transfer of uh, physical value itself. Mm-hmm. And so money itself um, uh, for its purpose is, is changing. And this is really interesting because um, when you look at the global currency systems, when you look at uh, the virtual currencies that's rising, um, there is basically a clash uh, on many levels. And for most people who stand on the sidelines, the world does not change. Mm-hmm. But by the time you wake up, the world has already moved on. And so I think for us, it's always about looking at uh, some of these issues and some of this phenomenon, whether it actually becomes a tipping point uh, in the future. And I think for us, um, anything to do with money, anything to do with the financial system, anything to make bank CEOs um, stay up at night um, is a potential issue that will tip the world. So I think we are, we are, we are certainly um, not using China as a focal point, but we are mm-hmm. certainly looking at the world that is actually um, looking at this issue and trying to either contain it or to go along with it or to just ignore it altogether. Right. And I'm also very, very curious about another work within the equivalent series. So as an angler and a proponent of sustainable self-harvest, actually almost all the fish that I eat are actually caught by myself. Um, the project, the ecological footprint of fish, you know, really stood out to me. So you know, all the fish there. Um, and I think it's your background right now, right? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, the starting point of that project? And what was the key message that, you were trying to bring across with it. Yes. Um, so this project was actually a collaboration with Greenpeace uh, and Greenpeace um, did, uh, has had seen our work before and, and understood our practice um, to be very powerful in, in positioning uh, complicated issues uh, to a wider audience. And so they wanted to work with us uh, to see how we could help them uh, in shaping uh, a message uh, on fish farming in China uh, mm-hmm. to a Chinese audience mainly. Uh, and so we worked with Greenpeace, uh, with scientists, uh, industry, fishing industry experts. Uh, we went down to fishing ports in Fujian uh, and basically uh, sought to understand, you know, what, what is the problem of, of fish farming? Uh, how is the value, how is the food chain uh, organized? And, and, and what, is, what are the gaps uh, that are going to be um, even bigger issues in the future if consumption uh, as it is continues? So mm-hmm. this was the, 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 how, it, how the project came to be. Right. And, and so um, I know that three large fish in the center is uh, a yellow croaker. Um, yes. And in, in Singapore, you know, the Putian chain, chain of restaurants has contributed to a surge in popularity of um, the yellow croaker as an uh, eating species. And as I understand um, this particular image, right, uh, those three yellow croakers um, come about get to that particular size because they've eaten all of the fish that's around them. Yes. yes. Have yes, I got yes. it right? Yeah. So it took yes. that many fish to produce three, what we would call table size yellow croaker. Yes. Um, one one and, kilogram of three fish um, yeah, took 7.15 kilograms of the smaller uh, fish that were caught from the sea to feed these fish that were being farmed. Right. And, and so that definitely is going to have an impact, you know, an ecological impact on all of those other species that are around the fish farm. Um, and it strikes me that the yellow croaker is also actually a very slow growing species in that regard. Um, and I have another interesting, like maybe fisherman's kind of knowledge, which is uh, pertaining to the hybrid grouper, which is like, I think, one of the most popular restaurant fish in Singapore. It is the, one of the fastest growing uh, fish because it's lab hybridized. It, it, it's not a naturally occurring species. And now it's becoming uh, an invasive species around local shorelines due to intentional or accidental release from uh, fish farms and kelongs um, in the Southeast Asian region. So these strike me as two kind of opposing scenarios. You know, um, One is a, a fast growing species. You, know, you would think that, oh, this could deal with the issue of scarcity. Uh, but it still results in an ecological crisis. The other is a slow-growing species, which it's inadvertently also resulting in somewhat an ecological crisis as well. You know, what do you think these two opposing scenarios both 
for the future of agriculture and consumption? Um, I, I think it's, it's trying to understand our food systems. I think uh, solutions that we come up with may not be perfect at the beginning. We certainly try. I think the scientists, um, the policy uh, uh, makers uh, and, and people involved in the, in, in the stakeholders involved in the industry when these innovations happen, uh, certainly hope that the innovations will help to solve certain problems in the industry. Uh, but certainly also it really needs a lot more um, inter- uh, sort of interligages and understanding um, the other implications that that may not be considered, and so I think mm -hmm. I think for issues like this, uh, you know, uh, having hybrid groupers uh, sounded like a great solution in the beginning, um, but of course with with fish farming with with hybridization, uh, we're also disrupting certain things in the natural ecosystem, uh, and 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 then you know it, it becomes like a catch up where you need to start controlling the other problems that are caused. Uh, of course, I think uh, eventually we will get to a better place uh, because we are also facing um, we are also facing uh, increasing population. So there there is definitely a need um, to be able to understand uh, how how agriculture advances would be able to secure uh, enough food supply in the future and how do we get there and solve the the problems that that we start facing with our innovations as well. So I think it is, it is an evolving advancement, um, but we certainly do need um, different stakeholders coming in from different angles to, to understand how the bigger picture can work out. Right, definitely. I think absolutely important. But before I get to my final question tonight, I would like to remind all of our viewers um, to put in your questions into the Facebook Live comment box for Chow and Lin if you haven't yet. Um, we have some time that we'll reserve for Q&A at the end. Uh, so remember to put in um, those questions. And so back to that final question that I have prepared for the two of you. Um, you know, I'm not going to be able to kind of let you off this tonight's conversation, right, without you sharing a little bit about your project, freedom or happiness. You know, especially given the circumstances in Singapore right now, which we are pretty much in lockdown light again. You know, um, freedom and, and happiness was, uh, or happiness was a very, very poignant work for me, especially because of the inclusion of the George Orwell quote that was uh, appended to it. Um, that quote being, the choice for mankind lies between freedom and happiness. And for the bulk of mankind, happiness is better. Um, for me, you know, the two are very much the same. I, I don't believe in that you know, happiness is possible without freedom or freedom um, can come from a lack of happiness, um, making me differ from mankind at large. So my question is, where does it lie for the two of you? We'll start with you first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think... Um... I, I think we certainly understand that freedom comes with a price. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the liberties that we have um, lived our lives in the past, uh, we have seen, uh, you know, are, are coming from uh, being fortunate to be within structures which are not perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, it, it means that the, our, our individual freedoms have also been at the expense of certain other parts of society and environment, uh, and this certainly is not sustainable. So I think the, the COVID situation is certainly a big wake-up call, and it certainly also points us um, to, uh, to bigger issues which then now compete uh, for attention uh, because they are, they are going to be needing so much more collaboration and, and uh, you know, uh, to, to, to try to solve together. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for me, um, happiness is... A, good to have um, but um, freedom and and um, sort of ability to make choices uh, I, I think is 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 what I, I hope um, that that we would all be able to get in the end mm. and you know, talk about yourself um, it's really complicated because I think um, um, we are also parents to children Mm -hmm. And we know it doesn't take much for them to be happy. And uh, especially when they are born into this world, you know. Um, babies born into this world don't know freedom, but they know happiness, they know sadness. And happiness is uh, perhaps a satisfying of needs, which are either immediate or short-term. 
as you go older, as you grow older, you realize that there is a distinct difference between the two. And for some of us, we may not grow up enough to understand the difference. And so freedom, as we, as I realize, becomes a privilege. Mm. Happiness can always come um, in short spurts um, or, or, or it could come in frequent frequencies or it could be seldom, but, free, um, but happiness comes and goes. But freedom becomes a privilege, becomes an awareness, and it's not necessarily a given. And I think that is what becomes really complicated. And here you have someone who um, obviously is very free to... Um, <laughs> Uh, to freedom, right hijack here. into our topic about happiness. Yeah, <laughs> it's unadulterated freedom on his part, and it's also <laughs> the ultimate symbol of happiness, I guess, for parents. Uh, but yes, you know, thank you so much for the lovely conversation um, tonight. But and as we wait for some um, Q and A questions from our audiences to stream in, uh, maybe just a few more from uh, my side. Uh, of course, you know the big question that. Uh, I think many um, individuals have, especially pertaining to, to art making, is um, how has the pandemic you know, really impacted your art practice? Uh, I think it, it has certainly given us um, a, a lot of motivation uh, to understand the issues, how things are interlinked. Uh, what can we do as artists? What is our role? And and you know how can we uh, how can we build platforms uh, to allow for more collaborative voices to come together um, mm -hmm. in in this? Yeah. yeah, I think I think um, let's not just talk about art. Let's talk about mm -hmm. creativity and great ideas. And I think a lot of uh, creative um, solutions and great ideas stem out from tensions. Um, they are not they don't come out during periods of peace and bliss, but during a time where, um, um, where solutions or opinions are to be made. So I think we definitely felt that our art practice have sharpened uh, in terms of our focus and importance because we felt that um, this has become even more urgent. Um, as we realized that uh, we could well be living in a tipping point right now. Um, the pandemic could well be just the beginning um, because after the pandemic, uh, what else happens? And um, we, have, uh, we have also become keen followers um, of history and we don't have to look back uh, very far to see the Spanish flu and to see how the Spanish flu itself has also created problems during the flu itself and what happens after. So, so I think for us, um, we are neither optimists nor pessimists. I think we are realists. And we also realize as artists, we, we like to use research in our work. That's why I think there is always a pessimistic point of view, not because we are not hopeful of human nature, but because we are realist, we are realistic yeah. about where things can go. So I think the pandemic has definitely um, sharpened our senses uh, in that. Yeah, and I, I, and I absolutely agree, you know, in, in these kind of uh, challenging circumstances, you know, all we can do essentially is to hope for the best while preparing for the worst at uh, the same time. So along that train of thought, uh, in terms of uh, hoping for the best, are there any new projects and exhibitions that you have lined up in the months or years to come? Um, oh, we are actually working with Gwen. We are working with Dak um, <laughs> on our next um, group show. And that will be in November in Xiamen in China. It's the Jimei Ao um, International Photo Festival. And it's actually a Singapore showcase. So uh, includes um, different Singapore artists. Uh, you have the familiar names like Robert Zhao, Song Nian, um, um, and even Klang, John Klang will be there as well. I missed a few yeah, yeah, names. Geraldine yeah. Kang uh, will be there as well, but I must have missed a few names, sorry. And um, we will be there. Uh, we plan to be there and representing the Singapore flag um, because there will be a Singapore pavilion for that. Um, we are also part of the Balarat um, 
photo biennial in near Melbourne in Australia. Uh, we know that um, um, they were very bullish uh, right at the start when we were discussing about things, but I think there's current fresh uh, lockdowns. So um, the festival is still going ahead, but I think the opening week is kind of disrupted. And our show is still on uh, at the OWL Festival right now. Um, it's open for about two weeks now. It'll go on for another two and a half months. So anyone who is in Southern France or in France itself, we urge you to go there and see the show. So, so we do have quite a few things planned. Yes, that sounds very exciting. And well, um, that's just about almost all the time that we have for tonight. However, before uh, we conclude today's session, um, Juliana Lim uh, has chimed in with a comment. Not so much a question, but a comment saying that, hi, Stefan and Huiyi, you are doing really important work using your art practice to reveal elusive truths about inequality. I hope your revelations change lifestyles and feed into public service policy around the world. Best with it, Jia Yu. Um, maybe you would just want to give a little response to that before we round up for tonight. Oh, thank you, Juliana. I, I think those are two high words for us. But we, we certainly um, hope that we can be part of, you know, of, of, of the, all the efforts which are working towards solutions. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think when we came out to do the work we do, we, I don't think our expectation is to change the world, but I think we hope to change the opinion of one person. And I think if that has changed something, then I think the work is done. And we definitely uh, feel motivated to continue doing this uh, for a long time ahead. All right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Stefan and Hui Yi. It was a real pleasure to have you. Thank um, you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. And to all of our viewers who are watching, uh, we would sincerely appreciate your feedback, which you can submit by scanning the QR code that will be flashed at the end of tonight's conversation. And while you are at it, if you enjoyed today's chat, please donate to the Safe Deck campaign to allow Deck to have a permanent home. Be sure to tune in for our next episode on the 12th of August as well, where we will speak to Singaporean photographer, George Wong. And so we will all catch you then. Take care and good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.